Hi Joe again, thank you for doing the interview. I was feeling a bit last night actually what a gift it is that you're actually doing these interviews. They're fun, eh? Hey? Yeah, they're actually oh, quite fun. I like them because the... we, we get the chance to um, go through a series of questions on a subject uh, rather than with the seminars a lot of times the you know the questions are very disjointed and not always relating to the subject. We mm-hmm. here we get a series of questions that we're compiling from people all around the world who are asking questions and then we get to put them all together and and put them in some kind of order of some kind. And so, so you're going to do this on an ongoing basis? Yeah, so the viewers the, can know. yeah, the hope is to actually um, do these interviews on all sorts of different subjects and pretty much anybody, anybody can interview, whether they're a person who's already discovered a little bit about the Divine Love Path or or even people who have uh, questions of me on religious matters or other matters. Um, so I'm happy to have pretty much anybody on the panel as long as they're respectful um, and loving in the manner in which they ask their questions. And uh, and I'm happy to give the people the, the answers. So we're hoping that, in fact, that we can do this on a re- fairly regular basis, at least once a week. Um, and that way we get to answer a lot of questions about a lot of subjects. And the beauty of doing it is that we get all of the questions on one subject um, all in the same sort of interview. So when somebody's watching something, they're not having to go all over the place to find the answer. So where would people write all their questions to in order to get that addressed? Yeah, there's a FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, just FAQ at divinetruth.com. And uh, with, the, with that, they'll be able to just send the questions to that address. And we have a team of people who are getting that address and then allocating the question to a certain uh, subject matter that uh, they already have. We're, obviously, there's thousands of questions. Mm. And uh, and then when we do an interview, we'll eventually be answering those questions. What we're trying to do is answer the questions that a lot of people have asked first or or that are uh, have maybe not been asked in the past very much. But uh, And we're trying to do it in sort of some semblance of order as well. Mm. Um, but there's also questions about my personal life, Mary and I's, my personal life and things like that that we'll include. Um, so any questions at all, pretty about much. About any topic. About any topic, whatsoever, mm. yeah. yeah. Like the one that we're doing now. Yeah, like the one we're doing now. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the topic that you remind me again. <laughs> well, we're actually talking about the secrets of the universe and extending discussions based on your That's right, original... how the universe is constructed, basically, mm. and so forth, yeah. Um, we... We, got, we were interrupted by the rain, and yeah. you're actually talking about specifically how to... You're illustrating reverse engineering as a process of discovering the universe yes, as opposed uh, to an alternative method. Yes. I, what, what we got to was this point that I was trying to make, which was the problem we face on Earth is that we try to reverse engineer everything God's done. So, for example, when we learned how to fly, we basically tried to reverse engineer how a bird flies, and then once we worked out that it was all to do with lift and the curvature of the wing, um, then we found the law of aerodynamics, and, and once we discovered those particular laws, then we could utilise those laws to our benefit. Um, so the, the, the case with all of mankind's discoveries has been basically that he it, it, it looks at things that are occurring generally in nature, and then he tries to replicate them in some way or make them simple to, to do in some way. And in almost all of our discoveries that have any longevity, uh, there's generally this process of reverse engineering by, by looking at something and examining how it works. Now, of course, there's a lot of creation we don't understand at this point. In, scientifically, we don't understand. For that reason, there's not much of creation that we've actually reverse engineered at this point. It's also a very slow process. Like, it's like getting a, like a whiteboard marker and then having to reverse engineer that whiteboard marker without understanding or without being, spe- without being able to speak to the person who actually created it. So the whiteboard marker has a purpose in that it can write on a whiteboard, and we know its purpose. But aside from that, we don't really know anything about it when we start this process of reverse engineering. Then we've got to go through, for in the case of whiteboard marker, the formulation of plastics, and in this case, you know, the type of uh, writing material they're going to be used, and how this writing, how the, if you like, the ink or, or the material that's used inside the marker to write that writes on the board, what kind of construction that needs to be from a chemical composition perspective and we need to discuss if we were reverse engineering that we'd have to go through this process of discovering so many things and then on top of that we would have to 
discover how to actually make that mm. as well. So how to formulate it and, and mould it into something that we can utilise. That's a very complicated piece mm. of material, something that is very simple nowadays to manufacture and make, but, but it's very, very complicated if you think if you had to reverse engineer it from scratch. Now, obviously, mankind has done that over a period of time. These whiteboard markers have come about. We created, you know, the writing pen first and the ink, and then it, it, over a period of hundreds of years, this particular thing got developed, if you look at the history of it, where initially, you know, we, initially they were writing on papyrus uh, with, with different materials, mm -hmm. and then eventually they discovered ink and what ink could do and paper and what paper and parchment could do and then they went through this process of fur further development and over thousands of years we came down to this point where we've got a marker that you can actually write on a board and rub off and then write again and rub off and write again and rub off um, something that some, something that's taken a long time to develop and that's how mankind discovers and develops things generally. And that's what mankind generally tends to think, that that's actually a part of their process of evolution. There's well, the it is a process of their... It is a, it is a part of their process of evolution, that's reality, mm. but it doesn't have to be that way. Mm. And it's also interesting, and if you think about it... If, if, if you think about the development of email, for example, you know, we first needed a whole series of systems to come into place computer systems, technology, wiring and all these other things had to come into place. And then and then on top of that we had to then develop servers, we have to develop a thing called the web, then then we had to build on that and we, eventually we build on that by adding email to the web and then eventually now you I can type up a message on one computer and send it to you. But but if I could telepathically communicate with you, all of that would be unnecessary. Hmm. You, you wouldn't need any of that. If I could telepathically communicate with any person in, in, in the world, then I wouldn't need to have email. And if I could telepathically connect to every person in the world, like, at the same time, then imagine that. Like, I, I wouldn't need to worry about any form of physical communication via email. And so, so what we often don't realise is that every new development that mankind's developed usually makes, of course, makes the old one obsolete. Right? And, and so we do a new development, the old one becomes obsolete, then new development, the old one becomes obsolete, but we needed to have the old one to discover the new one. That's generally how it's worked. And the reason why we do all of that is because we have no desire to connect with the manufacturer of our body or the manufacturer, more importantly, of our soul, and find out and discover from that being how we can actually utilise this soul and the bodies that we have in the best possible method. So, so this process of discovery or experimentation to discover new things, and it, the same applies with the discovery of the universe. Experimenting with the universe to discover new things about the universe is just, if not more, complicated than trying to discover how this works but over it's a period of thousands too, of years. Isn't it? It seems, the way you're speaking now, for me, it seems take such a long time. Yes. You know, when if I can telepathically think or teleport myself, you know, home yeah. in an instant. Then you wouldn't need a vehicle. No. And if you exactly. could teleport yourself home carrying some bags, mm. then you wouldn't need a vehicle at all. And mm. if you could teleport yourself home and teleport all your family at the same time, yes. then why yes. would you need a vehicle at all? Yes. Like, yeah. you know, really there's no need for such things. And, and this is the thing, is that's why every new discovery generally makes obsolete mm. the old discovery. The problem that we face, though, on Earth in the discovery of the truth of the universe is that, is that while we're experimenting, we've got to come up with millions of experiments, in mm. fact, to actually determine the truth. Somebody's got to first have a seed of an idea, then that idea has to have enough passion and drive behind the idea for the person to want to follow through with it. They've got to have some faith that their idea may actually be something that can be utilised in the future. They've got to have some uh, purpose, a drive inside of themselves, like a real passion and drive to discover that particular thing. And then they've got to do a, and come up with a whole series of experiments to work out whether that actually works or not, their idea, whether it works or not. And in this process, it's a very long-winded process, but it's also a very important process. And, and it's the exact same process, actually, that, that I used in the first century to discover divine love 
I used the exactly the same process, but I had a different focus. And this is the difference between our focus, is that we can do, we can do what I did in the first century, which is first discover whether God exists, first discover if God's willing to communicate with me, then I could ask God a whole series of questions so I guess and that's get a, the answers. So I guess that's the actual difficulty. Mankind in the past, without you being present on Earth 2,000 years ago, mankind never actually attributed to that being a creation by God yes. and all the elements. Yes. I'm sure prior to my existence in the first century, people did conceive of a possibility that God existed and God wanted to communicate with them, but they, would never, they never had a dedication to the actual process of the discovery of what that particular way or form of communication with God was. With myself, uh, there's always been an underlying desire with our soul, myself and Mary's, there's always been an underlying desire to discover the underlying process by which this occurs, this communication can occur. Now, so I had to use exactly the same discovery methods uh, that a person would use to discover the universe or, or any other form of physical phenomenon. But instead of focusing on all those other forms of physical phenomenon, I decided to focus all of my energy on God and discovering through this process of experimenting, God. In the process of uh, discovering God, what I found was that as I grew in love, in, uh, I could feel myself receiving that love from God through this process, as I grew in love, I seemed to automatically understand many other things that other people couldn't understand without growing in love first. And then, uh, so then I discovered one primary attribute of the universe, that in fact, what I believe is the most important thing in the universe to understand. And that is, without understanding and receiving God's love, it is impossible to discover very rapidly anything else in the universe. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. She's our, one of our videographers. <laughs> videographers, <laughs> right. and so, so, and in the process of focusing on the discovering of God, what I realised that I started to understand the universe in a completely different way. Mm. Scientists only now are starting to do experiments that actually I knew 2,000 years ago the truth of already. But are they attributing that towards God, though? No, not yet. No, they're just discovering the physical phenomena. For example, scientists are working on projects now where they have discovered the physical phenomena of your DNA and the emotions that you feel affecting your DNA, even if your DNA is in a place 400 miles away. So in other words, you have a feeling and the DNA that's in a room 400 miles away has an effect because of your feeling, that DNA has an effect. And it's immediate. The scientists are only starting to even con contemplate experimenting with these particular ideas. But these were ideas that I discovered very, very rapidly in the first century. So I knew about all of these ideas in the first century because as I communicated with God, the source of all of these things, I was educated by God as to how all of these things worked. So, so man, like even with myself, I was on a process of discovering something, but I never knew what I was really discovering. Yep. I was just always asking. Yep. And eventually I received the truth by meeting yourself. Yep. And it was very direct. Yep. Um, what happens to those people, the scientists, who aren't willing to listen to that type of truth? How will they discover that process? Well, they will discover it the same way that they always have. And that is through this process of experimenting, coming up with ideas, experimenting with the ideas, and eventually finalising the truth. But they must come to realise that the process may take thousands of years to occur, just like, just like the finalisation of this whiteboard marker has been through thousands of years of development of writing implements over, over a long period of time of humanity's interest and, and history. And so what I feel is that it's far better to be able to... And by the way, I might, <coughs> before I proceed, I must point out, this is going to be obsolete. Yes. <laughs> Just like every other thing we've discovered and implemented That's has become true. obsolete in time. <coughs> and... And what I feel the better way of connecting to, thing, to things and discovering the secrets of the universe is connect to the source of the universe and then ask that source of the universe questions about the universe and go through this process of feeling, this feeling communication that you can have with God directly. And particularly once you become at one with God, that's possible. 
and, and you can communicate and find the discovery of these truths. There is also a secondary way of doing it and that, that most scientists also ignore, although they're often being guided by it all the time. And that is, there's a whole group of people who used to live on Earth who are now in the spirit world who were scientists, who were musicians, who were artists, who were all... They had uh, developed a lot of knowledge while they were on Earth. They passed in the spirit world. They realised a lot of that knowledge wasn't the full knowledge of the universe and they've discovered a lot more since. And what many of them do is they come back to Earth and influence the next generation of scientists or artists or, or, or engineers or mechanics or any other form of, of person who's on the Earth. And that's another alternate way of discovering more about our universe. And that is, instead of closing down the option of, di of discussion with our, with our spirit friends, who are really our brothers and sisters in the end who have just mm -hmm. passed before us, we could open up this discussion but unfortunately, uh, religion in particular has been very uh, opposed to that form of discussion through, and because there are certain dangers that, uh, that in those forms of discussion that we need to understand. Mm -hmm. but, um, and, and we need to therefore prepare ourselves for and deal with, uh, emotionally deal with. But what mankind has done is they go, oh, that's too dangerous, we can't go there with the spirit communication. So that closes down all of the people who have ever passed before us from communicating with us using an overt method, using something that we're aware that it's actually happening. So what they've had to do now is they've had to be, be, use more subversive methods to communicate with us via our feelings and our desires and so forth. And so for many of us, we could, have, we could learn and could have learned far more truth by just listening to what they've already discovered because they've had the option of discovering many more things because of their ability to, to go to different locations and check things out more rapidly. We, humanity, it, just using that method, would have a far, have far better way of discovering the universe than using our current form of experimenting with the physical. The third but most important method is the, is the complete connection with God. Most of humanity wants to reject the complete connection with God. And I am including even religious people in this because, because we have a connection with God, but they want to also hold on to their unhealed emotional state. They, want to, they don't want to bring themselves into complete harmony with love and, and complete harmony with love of self, love of your neighbour, love of their soulmate, their partner, love of God. And so what they do is they resist certain areas which automatically create blockages in learning. If we opened ourselves to that third form of learning, then we would realise a lot of things about God. And in the process of realising a lot of things about God, we could connect to God in a, more, in a more real way and also receive direct information through that process of inspiration. And then a lot of the things that we now don't even understand at all, mankind generally doesn't understand, could easily come to us over a very, very short period of time. We have the capacity on the earth to grow within 10 years, to, to have a completely different world. That's how powerful our souls are, if we embraced connecting with God first. If we embrace connecting with our spirit friends, we have the capacity to change the world over hundreds of years, right, rather than over tens of thousands of years. If we go and con continue with this current form or method that we use, the so-called scientific method, which I don't believe is as scientific as what we believe it to be, but if we continue with that method, it will still take thousands of years to develop something like a pen, <laughs> um, you know, let alone something of a more complex nature. And it's far better, if, if you can see, to use the other two methods. So um, once we do that, we, under we start understanding God and therefore start communicating with God, we now have the ability to discover the secrets of the universe for the first time, actually, to discover it in a very, very rapid way in a very short period of time. From the time that I consciously saw myself in the first century as being a person who would have to be a leader in discovering things about God, which was when I was about 18 years of age, to the time I became at one with God took me 13 years. Now, that is a very, very short period of time if you consider what I learnt during that period of time and, and what I knew after that, after that process of becoming at one with God. And, and not only that, I then had the other side benefits, which were all to do with healing and helping, you know, helping others in a different way. And they all come along as a part of the parcel um, of discovering God. And, uh, and this is what 
I feel the secrets of the universe discussion is interesting because if we we can answer a whole series of questions about how the universe is constructed, why it's constructed the way it is, how it all is fragmented in terms of broken up into and, and with there being interstellar boundaries between each dimensional space. We can discuss how to communicate or move between interstellar spaces and all of those kind of things, which are all physically possible and also knowledge that I do have to discuss. Fascinating topics. <laughs> but, but in the end, it's not the important topic. Mm. The important topic is how... Did Jesus discover those things? That's, That's the important topic. And it's interesting because I came across a message, actually my partner came across a message, and I just wanted to yeah. read it. It's in, um, as you said, it's a spirit communication yeah. farm by um, just a fellow Frederick, I think his name was, to James Paget, And it reads, In closing, let me repeat that divine love is the greatest thing in all God's universe, and not only the greatest, but the sum of all things from... It flows every other thing that brings peace and happiness. So James is stating that as a man mm -hmm. on earth. Mm -hmm. Does he actually truly feel that that's the truth? Because he's received it from a spirit. But Well, this is a problem. Is uh, We can hear a lot of things about divine truth and hear a lot of things about divine love, but, it, but it's a process in your soul that you do have to personally embrace. So it's not possible to intellectualise the process. And this is where we're, we're, most of mankind is always coming from the intellectual perspective. So, so the very first time we hear divine truth, we're always trying to intellectualise it. We're even trying to intellectualise what a prayer is or intellectualise how, how to get closer to God or how to deal with an emotion and so forth. And so we still don't really understand the truth of the matter while we're in that space. And we've got to go through this process of understanding that there's something outside, outside of this intellect outside of the spirit body's mind that that is a part of my feeling nature that I need to embrace. And once I go through this process of discovery of that, then you, you also are forced into a process of self-discovery. You're forced into a process of discovery of God if you do it in a, in a, in a manner that, uh, that opens you to love and opens you to the, the different parts of the universe that are closed to you before you deal with it. And also, there's no progress beyond the sixth dimension of the spirit world without you doing this. So the reality is that God has constructed a universe that can only be understood at the emotional level, at the soul level. The intellect is a byproduct of that. That's how God discovered the universe. Mankind wants it to be the intellect first, and the emotions are sort of a byproduct of that. Mm. And, and whenever we go down that second route, we're always precluding information from entering us, from spirits, but also from God. And, uh, and yet there's this huge amount of information, infinite amount of information available to us very rapidly that we possibly can or potentially absorb. But while we're blocked to the way in which we can absorb it, it's impossible for it to flow into us. And uh, that's what I discovered in the first century and that's why I said, keep on seeking then first the kingdom, or what I actually said was keep on seeking first God's love and all these other things will be added to you. And what I meant by that was, if you seek first, like I did in the first century, God's love and this relationship with God and love first, all other knowledge of all other things, scientific or otherwise, will come to you without the need of you having to experiment. So do you feel that's the most important thing that we need to do on Earth? Well, that's the most important secret of the universe, mm. if you like. That's the, that's the primary one. Now, very many people are going to resist that because of all sorts of different emotions that they have. Some have emotions about what they believe truth to be and they want to hold on to that very strongly. So whether it's, a, whether it's a, an atheist or a scientist or, a, or a, religion, a, religion, a person in religion, like you know, someone, someone who's Muslim or Christian or any other form of religion, all of these things really are religions in a way, in the sense that they fix the, the human soul to a perspective that is damaging to the human soul because it doesn't allow the communication with God to work out whether these perspectives are true or not. So you're saying that if you have a, a limitation to receiving truth, 
that you will not then receive those secrets. It's impossible. The, the secret that there is divine love, the secret that God exists. Not only that, the secret the of how teleportation of... works, and the secret of how <laughs> levitation works, and the secret of, uh, or, and the secret of how healing works, and the secret, you know, like there's all these different secrets that man has yet to even discover, um, which we could easily be discovering, but we have to be in the right place for it first. You see, it's no good having teleportation as a as an as an option when mankind is generally in a space where they would use it in an unloving manner. And why would God give the gift of the knowledge to somebody who would use it in an unloving manner? You've got to start asking yourself those, those questions. And once you connect with God, you realise the entire universe is all based around love. So, so it's impossible for me, without going hundreds and thousands of years of time, it's impossible for me to discover that particular thing without help from somewhere or, uh, or without love being present in myself. So what happened with the discovery of many of our, our discoveries in human nature is we've gone to the point where we've had enough love to discover something. Then we've utilised that thing in an unloving manner, which has caused the degradation of the human race. Then we realise that it's unloving to do it that way, and so we then start utilising that particular thing in a loving manner. <laughs> And then we decide that uh, we get through all of that process and now we're really to discover some more truth about that particular thing. So normally you see this cycle occur in humanity. You get, there's a ramp up of love, we discover something, then there's the degradation of love that occurs through the utilisation of that thing. Mm -hmm. Then we realise that we're doing the wrong thing as, a, as humanity then we start increasing in our loving way of utilising that thing that we discovered. Right? We, if you look at the pattern, you'll see this pattern everywhere. Like man discovered flight a few years later, they were using aeroplanes to drop bombs in the First World War. The very first aeroplanes that were mass produced were mass produced for war. Right? So for immediate purpose. For destructive purpose. For immediate unloving way in which we utilise the information. But what occurred just prior to that? So did the, the inventor have enough love in him? The inventor themselves had enough love to realise the power of their particular invention and what good it would do to humanity. The good it would have done would have been, would have been it shortens the distance of, being, of getting between two places very markedly. And so therefore it, it, it pulls the world, which was quite distant apart from each other, into this place where now the world is like a few hours away. You know, the very furthest point on this planet from me is only, what, 25 hours away in terms of any direction. I can go in any direction in 25 hours and I can go and, and visit people there and discover things there. Now, the inventors of this, of the fl of flight, knew this to be a possibility and eventually there was enough love in them to, to want to give the gift of their discovery to the world but then there's people who grab that discovery, utilise it for unloving purposes, mm -hmm. and then we go through this transitional period. Where, and we still haven't even come out of the transitional period of using aeroplanes for unloving purposes. Mm -hmm. We still haven't even come out of it. This is 100 years later, mm -hmm. and we still haven't come out of that transition for, for aeroplanes. You look at it for, the, for nuclear weapons, right? There's people, there were people dedicated to discover of nuclear, nuclear power, and it ramped up during the Second World War because of the, the competition, if you like, between the Nazi regime and the Western powers. And eventually there was this discovery of the nuclear... of, of the atom, what happens when it splits and so forth. The immediate integration into that into something that's an unloving act. So there's enough love to discover it and desire to discover it, and then all of a sudden, bang, we've got an unloving act. Now, man, so what does man do straight after that? Stockpile thousands of them to, in an ability to completely destroy every living creature on the planet, if they all went off at the same time, completely destroy the entire planet. And, and even now, we've still got six or 7,000 of them or more on the planet because everyone's reluctant to dismantle them. Like, well, that's fair, isn't it? Yeah, it's Making fear, control. yes, of course. So what happens is we discover something and then there's the fear-based utilisation of that thing. 
and then it increases to the love-based utilisation. Now, the love-based utilisation, you could, you could sort of say that we're heading towards the love-based utilisation of nuclear power by generating electricity for people using nuclear power. Right? Now, it's still not completely loving in that all this waste comes out of the, pro the process that causes a lot of trouble if it's not dealt with appropriately, and we still haven't learnt to deal with all of that appropriately, but, but at least there is a more loving action that's been taken mm -hmm. by humanity to, for, for that particular discovery. Mm -hmm. If we were in the place, emotionally, where we automatically would use every new discovery for loving purposes, we would be automatically far more open to receiving truth about every new discovery and therefore the much more rapidly change humanity. That's a subsequent result. So who would be teaching us? God would be teaching us through... Yes, yeah, so, so we don't do anything unless it's in harmony with love. So we discover some, some new thing because we've heightened our condition of love and we've connected more strongly to God, therefore received through this process we've become more aware of our surroundings we receive information very rapidly in that place we then receive information also from maybe other spirits as well we get to the point where this information uh, is present to us and we decide in our hearts we are only going to use this information for loving purposes every single person in humanity decides that now a lot of people say well that's a utopian society and i can't agree I feel that if every person in humanity connected to God and every person in humanity connected to their own pain and the sources of their own pain, they'd realise there is no alternative yeah. than to do it in a loving manner. Mm. Right? And if every person on the planet realised there was no alternative, then we wouldn't be any more doing unloving mm. things on the planet. Mm. Um, so, so I think we have the ability to change very rapidly on the planet, but it needs, firstly, this like drawing a group of people into this at one moment connection with God and then seeing where that connection takes every one of those persons. That is the primary part to me of discovering the secrets of the universe. Yeah. Now, there'll be people watching this interview going, well, he hasn't told us much about, you know, how the, how the, the physical universe operates and how these dimensional spaces operate. Well, the, the structures and well, the reality is I can tell you all of those things, and we will at some other point probably discuss all of those things. But how many people are going to be ready for that information? How can they utilise that information in their day-to-day -day life? Well, very few are going to be ready for it, let alone utilise it. There, there's certainly... We could drive many experiments to prove this information is true. That could easily be done. But uh, how many people are going to want to do that and risk the ostracism, which is an emotion, risk the ostracism of their fellow scientists? Very few. So, so the emotion of my feelings about how you might attack me influences whether I'll even experiment with something that you don't like. Mm. And, uh, and until I address that emotionally, how open I, am I to new truth? Mm. Not very open. So, so the reality is... Mankind cannot, can only do this very slow experimental process until mankind themselves decide to change from an emotional perspective everything about our life, everything. Even how I feel about you attacking me needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. And if I do that, then... See, if I am no longer hooked into how you feel about what I am doing then I'm going to go ahead and do some things that, that might freak you out, that might make you angry, that might make you disbelief, and all those kind of things. But I'll still go ahead and do them. If I'm in a state of love, I'll still do them in a state of love. But I'll go ahead and do them, even though you're, you're you know, heavy with me with all of those different emotions, I'll still go ahead and... I won't be afraid that you'll kill me and I won't be afraid that you'll attack me and I won't be afraid of everybody, you know, blasting me on the internet and nobody liking me anymore. I won't be afraid of my wife leaving me or my husband leaving me and, I won't, and my friends disowning me and any of those things. I won't be afraid because I've dealt with that emotion. I'm no longer hooked into what anybody else feels about me. When I'm no longer hooked into what anybody else feels about me, I have the ability to discover many things. Just that one emotion gone from my soul, and I have now the, discovery, the ability to discover lots of things that I could not discover before then. 
And when you add God's love into the equation, what then happens? As well, the beauty of having God's love in the equation is in the previous example where I've disconnected, let's say, from how everybody else feels about me, I still feel alone, right? The beauty of having God in the equation is you never feel alone and you always have someone to communicate with and you always can receive communication from that person. So even when you are totally alone in a, in a physical sense, you are never alone at all and you don't even feel alone anymore. So you can be the only person on the planet doing something, being open to new information from different sources external to the planet and, and because you are totally through this emotion of not worrying anymore, you know, not feeling a response inside of you anymore to how people feel about you, you're now completely open to the discovery of the facts about that particular thing. And if you have a scientific approach, you now can discover the facts and prove the facts as you go along. And to me, that's the fastest way we can change. And so, like, I feel every discussion that begins with the secrets of the universe needs to dis re really needs to begin with the discovery of God. Mm -hmm. Of course, most people uh, who ask questions about the secrets of the universe very rarely ask any questions about the discovery of God. Mm. It's quite interesting. Which is interesting. Well, it leads on to the question in terms of what does God want to teach us? If we do discover God, what's the process? And what is it that God actually wants to teach us? about the universe and about ourselves? Well, firstly, um, the first thing God wants us to teach us is that we have the capacity as, as humans, because, because we are the pinnacle, the human soul, not, not the physical form or the spirit body form, but the human soul, which is an amalgamation of its two halves, is the pinnacle of God's creation. And as the pinnacle of God's creation, it has the ability to grow infinitely under one circumstance. And this circumstance is the, when it receives divine love into the soul. So, so if we want to do everything uh, in complete uh, disharmony with God, God has also given us the free will to do that. But the problem with doing that is that we will only grow to the point where we can be the maximum person we could be. In other words, we've only grown to the finite limitation of what the human soul was intentionally first created for. That's all we're grown to. We can't grow beyond that point. To grow beyond that point, we have to connect to God in, and receive divine love. Now, once we do that, God is saying to us, now, through this process of the reception of my love, God's love, now you, his child, has the ability to grow infinitely and to expand infinitely as a soul. Now, if you, if you consider it, potentially, we could become very similar in nature to God if we continue to do that. Like the more of divine love that infiltrates your soul, the more like God you become. Does God want that from us? Yes. Well, when you say want that, no, God's, God's given it. His underlying purpose of creating us was to give us the gift of his love. Whether we choose to have that or not is up to us. So God, God's not saying to you, you must do this, Anto. What he is saying, though, is I have given you the gift of, you know, create, I've created you to be the personality and character that you've become and have the ability to grow and change from that personality and character. But if you choose to do it without me, without God, right? And I'm not saying I'm God there. I'm just saying mm -hmm. I'm, I'm putting myself in God's position and having I'm discussion with that. Anto. So, so God's saying to Anto, if you choose to do that without me, then you will be able to become the most perfect being I created you be to become on your own right, under your own steam, with your own exercise of your own desire. Now that being is the person that you will realise when you enter the sixth dimension of the spirit world, and which can also be entered here on earth. It's, a, it's what I would call the perfection of the natural man. That's the degree to which you can expand. But then God's also saying to Anto, he's saying, Anto, I have this other gift, this gift of a personal relationship with me. And if you accept this gift, this gift means that you're going to have to open to truth completely, you're going to have to open to love completely, and you're going to have to be very, very humble, much more humble than you were on the other place. right? 
And if you open to, to this gift, I have the ability, through my love, to expand the creation of your soul that I originally created into a new creature. And this new creature is able to do many other things that this other creature can't ever do without my love entering it. And that's the offer that God's making. This is my offer to you, this gift of my love, and, and the transformational power that it has upon your soul is being offered to you. What do you want to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to accept the offer or are you going to continue doing things on your own back, using under your own steam, with your own intellect involved, and develop to the perfection of what you could possibly develop? So how yourself? do we know this is happening, AJ? How do we know um, that God is connecting with us? You know, for somebody who, who doesn't actually know that there is a God, who doesn't know God exists, how yeah. does that feel? Well, now we're asking a whole separate quest, set okay. of questions, I feel, okay. that don't relate to the subject that we're discussing. So how does Anto know then that he's, he's forming that relationship with God? You were just talking to him then about that. And I feel that's a whole separate okay. set of discussion. The, okay. the, the question I was asked was <laughs> yes. what are the most important things in the universe okay. you could discover? And mm. I've just said what they are. Yeah. You have a choice to discover this process of becoming a self-actualised being and the further the furthest that you can develop to is the sixth dimension of the spirit world becoming a perfect natural man that's one of your choices during that process you will have to discover everything yourself you'll have to experiment and when i say discover everything yourself you probably collaborate with other people humans and spirits eventually when you pass and so you collaborate with information. So sometimes you'll discover things very rapidly because someone tells you. Mm -hmm. you know, so so in, instead of having to discover how to manufacture the whiteboard marker, you just go to the manufacturer of the whiteboard marker and say, can you tell me how to do that? Mm -hmm. And they say, yeah, no worries, I'll tell you. And they give you all the descriptions. You go, no worries, I'll go off and do that now. And that will happen quite yeah. frequently too. But somebody had to discover how to happen, yeah. how to do it first. And that is the furthest you can go in the natural love, becoming the perfected mm -hmm. in natural love. That's one option. example. Has there ever been an example of that on earth? I no. know you've talked about in the Bible it refers to, I believe it refers to a man mm. and a man. Yeah, the only examples on earth that were ever um, in, this, in this position of becoming the perfect natural man were a man and a man, or what uh, Christians know as Adam and Eve. They were discovered, they, they, sorry, they were planted on the planet by God, and in that process of the initial infiltration of the human soul into the physical and spiritual forms and right at that moment they were the perfect natural man they were, they were blank in terms of experience though they didn't know everything what did they understand right at that moment did they understand the importance of God did they understand God's existence the importance of God's love well no they understood nothing they understood nothing um, but they had the ability to find out everything using one of two methods they could find out everything using the method of connecting with God yeah. or they could find out everything through the process of self-discovery discovery through experimentation. What they chose to do was they chose the process of self-discovery through, through experimentation. That had an automatic degrading effect upon themselves because they now walked away from the source of love. And so therefore, over periods of time, the human race degraded in its condition until it reached really what I would classify as a hellish condition, you know, a condition that we're not far removed from today on the planet, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's our choice. We have now... So we can discover the universe using method number one, which is our own will, desire, intellect and everything else, and that method is going to involve experimentation, and the only way we're going to be able to do that is through a scientific method that we've already discussed and we've already discovered on the planet as to what the scientific method is, pretty much. This alternative form of discovery, which is not available to persons who decide that, but is available to persons who decide to connect with God, is to connect with God, the source of all truth, and to, and to grow in love in the process and therefore become more open to receiving truth from God and also from universe and from our own experiment still. But the, most, the, the biggest experiment or the most grandest experiment we can ever undertake is, does God exist or not? Mm. And does God want a personal relationship with me or not? That's the grandest experiment. So I guess God's really created a universe 
that's like a playground to mm. do exactly that. Yes. And, and, that's the, really and the playground is available to people who want to choose that or that. And then you can just expand in the playground by keep on receiving divine love. Yes. Intellectually, I'm yes. just talking about that. Yeah. And Because I haven't had the experience. Yeah. But I guess it's, you sort of support Frederick's statement. The importance is actually discover God's love. Yeah, because if you discover God's love, you have the ability now to grow beyond the capacity of a person who is doing everything without God. So while the person who's doing everything without God may enjoy their life, if you discover God's love, you have the potential also to have far more enjoyment of your life. So, so there are so many more things that you can obtain through this pr relationship with God. But, but the scientists would, would want to believe that, it's, that this is all religious. And the religionists want to believe that, that it's all religion <laughs> as well. Mm. And I'm saying, no, no, no. I'm talking about the discovery of everything in the universe. And that's the difficulty, that's what, Compared. what people struggle with. Mm -hmm. but the, it seems like that they're looking for a physical representation of God's love. In the, for scientists, they're looking for as evidence of it. But there is evidence of it. Um, but you will only be open to performing the experiment. If you receive. Not necessarily if you receive. You'll only be open to exploring, exploring the experiment if you're willing to conceive that such an experiment exists. Mm. If you conceive in your mind that such an experiment cannot exist, then you are never going to invent one that works out whether such love does flow in the universe. <laughs> does that make sense? And this is a problem, is that mankind limits himself through his mental inclination and his unhealed emotions. He limits himself to what he's potentially able to discover and what he's willing to discover, in fact. Do you feel that every man will eventually get to that point where they will discover that process, that they will make that choice to explore and discover God? Given an infinite uh, amount of time, it would not surprise me if every man will eventually discover that particular process. Mm. But an infinite amount of time is a long time. It's extremely long time, <laughs> <laughs> if we follow the analogy. Yeah, exactly. So, so I would prefer to see that that mankind open themselves to the idea of, of its potential um, as soon as possible. Because when you do it as soon as possible, you could, you could discover it within 10 years, 15 years. You could become at one with God. In the first century, it took me 13 years. And I've been in the process this century now eight years. So, so there's now I potentially could take another five years of my life. But, um, and, or even longer, um, considering I'm coming from a different position this time. But the issue is, like, as I go through this process, um, I'm already, in my case, remembering many things that I already knew, but, but for many people who are doing it for the first time, they would discover for the first time many things that they thought they knew, but they didn't know. Which and, I'm learning mm, myself yeah. through this process. Yeah. So the beauty... Is, I, I feel the basis of any questions about the universe need to be, firstly, what method of discovery do I wish to use? Do I wish to use what I would call the scientific method of discovery through experimentation without God? Mm -hmm. Or do I want to use the scientific method of discovery through experimentation with God? Because that, that's going to be a lot faster connecting to the source of the universe than it is to be connecting to the universe itself. There is literally an infinite number of things we could discover in the universe, and if every one of them takes us 2,000, 3,000 years to discover, it's going to be a long time. Of course, we might feel it's an enjoyable time, but we'll have times of frustration, we'll have times of annoyance, we'll also different unloving emotions will probably develop in the soul, and therefore we will also act in unloving ways and so forth as well. We go through this other process of discovery of the universe, we have the potential to discover very, very rapidly the secrets of the universe that nobody else understands and therefore benefit from them, which will improve our own happiness and improve our own quality of life and improve a lot of things around us as a result. It creates more love. Yeah, yeah. it creates more love. But see, we, we often on the planet, we hear the statements of, oh, yeah, that will create more love. But on the planet, hardly anybody even knows what love no, is. That's true. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so the reality is they don't even know about love very much but if you connect to God God can teach you that as well yeah, yeah. can teach you love as well as everything else yeah. and love certainly brings a lot of happiness mm. yeah. in terms of divine love what is it uh, is that the glue of the universe so to speak is it a representation every matter that exists is that an element of the love 
in a physical representation? No. Um, the reality is on the in the universe that God has created what I would call his agape love or his love that he has for all things. This is not the divine love. The divine love and his and the love that he has for all things are completely different from each other. So God has a love for you specifically and that love is in two forms. One is a love, the same kind of love that God has for any other living creature. Mm-hmm. And the other kind of love is this a potential that you must engage. And that is the personal love that God can give to you and you can have for God. It's like a personal relationship. So, for example, you can meet a person for the very first time and express love towards them through your actions. You know, you could do something for them with no strings attached or whatever. You are giving them love. You don't have a personal relationship with that person at that moment. You are giving them your love. You don't even know them. You don't even know their character. You don't know their personality. You don't know their attributes. But you're still giving them love. God has that form of love for all people. And he knows, of course, their character, personality and the attributes because he created them. But the second form of love, which is the personal relationship form of love, now that is divine love, what I call the divine love. That's a different form of love than what everybody else on the planet is talking about as divine love. They're talking about the first thing when they talk about divine love. When I'm talking about divine love, I'm talking about the second thing. This is the personal relationship that's possible between yourself and God. Not the generalised love that God has for all of her creatures, but this personal relationship between the two of you, where you can communicate through this relationship, you can feel God's personal love for you, you have personal love for God. This is a relationship type of love. Now, in that process, you come to discover the attributes, qualities, characteristics of God. Right? And often, you also come to discover your own characteristics through the process, right? Because your own characteristics are exposed. Some of them are unloving, and you expose them and release them from your life. Others are, you've never seen before, but they're very loving, and you discover them, and you start embracing these desires and passions that you have. And that's a process of self-discovery that's automatically exposed when you connect with God. Because God's basically saying, I created you, you beautiful person. You just don't know you yet. <laughs> right? And we have the ability to come to know ourselves in this process. So you discover all the other secrets, the secret that there is actually a soul. You discover the secrets about the soul, emotions, the power of your emotions and the effect of your emotions on your physical body, the effect of your emotions on your spirit body, all of the... Hit- all of the sicknesses in your body, the marks, the blemishes, all the things that happen in your body, all of them are able to be cured and, and negated through this process of discovery because you now discover all of those things. And, in, and now that you're a fully in tune individual, particularly when you become a one with God, now you have the ability to discover everything external to yourself as well in its most raw form as well. So, so you can go straight up to a person and you can hear what they're thinking, for example. Right? You can feel what they're feeling. You go, wow, that person's feeling some pretty rough things at the moment and thinking some pretty rough things at the moment, right? And you can feel that, but you don't have judgment for it. You, you can actually work with that. Um, you, you can also f- feel the same connection with plants, animals, birds, other living creatures, insects, everything around you. You have the same level of connection with. You can feel it and therefore know what it feels. And then you start understanding a lot of truths automatically. So you get bombarded with truths from the universe then. Like it's not a matter of having to write down an experiment to discover one of them. You're now getting bombarded with these truths every single moment of every single day. Like, oh, there's there's that thing. Oh, there's that thing happening as well. And you see them all very rapidly because you're now one with God and therefore completely open to everything that God has created. Now, to me, if you want to ask questions about the universe... That's the place to start. Hmm. Because, so to me, discovering the secrets about God and my personal ability to have a personal relationship with God, that is the most important discovery you can ever make. Because when you engage that discovery, you now have the ability to completely connect with all of God's creations and therefore understand all of God's laws Not all at once, because it's still a process of experimenting, but because you you, you, you have to grow, you have to go through this process of change. But the process of change, your ability to change, is incredibly rapid in comparison to having to go through this other place 
this self-realized place. And there's this real excitement when you talk about that, mm. yeah. of, of the joy of discovery. Like, it's when we go to school and learn, there is no joy in it. It's quite... Yes. Well, a lot of times you think about school, the joy is taken away from you by the time you're in sort of grade three or four or five or definitely by grade seven of school, now you're getting homework and now it's becoming a drudgery and you're now learning a lot of things you don't really know if you really want to know about. And so by that stage, it's becoming a real uh, difficulty for most people learning. Mm -hmm. And most learning is a difficulty, not because of the information being bland, but because of the emotions that we have. See, in, so. in Frederick's statement, and yeah. he agrees essentially in what you're saying, mm -hmm. what's the difference that occurred for him? Because um, he lived on Earth, mm -hmm. he didn't have that discovery, mm -hmm. but he, he channels that as a message to a person on Earth yeah. as to what is discovered in the spirit of it. What's the difference? What's occurring there? Well, what happens most of the time for most people who pass, who have some kind of a connection with God without having it really realised or actualised in some way, is they still have a desire to know about God and they still have a desire to what they call worship God and so forth. And so what happens is while they're on earth, they're doing the things they've been taught to do, to, to worship God in the manner that they've been taught to worship God. So if they're a Muslim growing up, they've been taught to worship God under a certain framework of the Koran. And, and so when they pass over, they still have that idea of that framework. If they're a Christian that's been brought up with the Bible, then, they, then they've got the framework of the Bible or their understanding of it that causes them to have that framework when they enter the spirit world. But they enter the spirit world and they discover that things are not what are said in those particular holy books. There's a lot more to it than that. They, what they believed was a limit of God's, uh, what you call God's inspiration on earth through, through books, they realised was only a tiny little fraction of anything they could have learnt about any subject, right? So what they do then is they start embracing this discovery process about God, because it is a, fa a fascinating subject. And in the process, they discover that they can receive divine love. They're obviously helped by others through the process, and they discover they can receive divine love. Once they discover that, then they realise how important that is for the first time. So even on earth, they didn't realise how important that was. So you think of most people who are Christian religious on earth or Muslim on earth or any other form of religion on earth, they don't realise really how important the connection with God is yet. Like in terms of all of their life, not just their worshipping life. I never did when I was in the Christian faith. Yeah, yeah. And and yet when they when they pass over the spirit world and they go through this transition, then they start they realise if I connect with God and I receive God's love, my soul is automatically grown and now I can start to understand all these questions that I had before. Even questions that I had on earth that I couldn't answer before now are all answered. And so of course they go hang on a sec, everyone on earth needs to know this. <laughs> everyone on earth needs to understand that this is the most important thing. Unfortunately, though, a lot of people on earth are completely blocked to that knowledge and many people on earth have become very intellectually dominant and they don't believe in God very much and so forth and so they try to push all of that aside. And even the people who do believe in God don't believe, don't understand what is possible with God. And so they push all that aside because they've got a holy book that tells them all the things that are possible, just the fraction of things that are possible, mm -hmm. and they believe that is the limit of God's inspiration. And so what they do on Earth is they then shut down this process of experimentation in all these different areas. When you pass over into the spirit world, you start experimenting all these areas and you go, whoa, there's a lot more I can discover here than what I realised on Earth. And God's love is the core to it all. It's the, it's the underlying foundation. It's the framework that I have to discover, every, discover everything else. So we start seeing, if you like, if you can picture a, a foundation. And in the first century, I use this illustration quite a lot. If you have a foundation of rock, then you can build a structure on it. And, and all sorts of pressures can come on the structure, but the structure won't be destroyed. You know, so it can rain heavily and the big winds come. And if you're t securely tied to this rock, it's very, very hard for the structure to be destroyed. But if you've got a structure that has built on a foundation of sand, in other words, there's no foundation or very little foundation, a little bit of water comes, a little bit of erosion comes, and before you know it, one wall's caved in. And, then, and this is what man's discovery is like. You know, we're going to have cave in after cave in after cave in with all of these discoveries because in the end the foundation isn't there when you build the foundation on God's love 
And I'm not talking about his general love for everything. I'm talking about his personal love for the individual. When you build the foundation on that, now you have the capacity to build a structure that will survive. So you can build upon information more and more and more and more and get to the point where now every new addition or discovery that you make you, is a part of the formulation of the bigger structure. And it all fits together. That's the beauty of it. So you know through your own investigation of divine truth that it all starts fitting together like a like this jigsaw puzzle. Mm-hmm. Questions you've asked for all of your life. Bang, there's the answer there, there's the answer there. Everything starts fitting together very rapidly, mm-hmm. right? Makes everything more logical. Everything's yes. logical. Mm-hmm. Love is yes. logical. <laughs> and there's uncompromise in it. It's permanent. It's permanent. Like a foundation. You don't, you you don't have to shift your belief mm-hmm. system after that because you know that it's proven. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas every man, every one of mankind's belief systems may have to be shifted at some point in the future, and often is, and made obsolete by the next discovery. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and we, we, right at this moment in human history, we are still basing most of our lifestyle and most of our technological engineering discoveries and mathematical discoveries based on previous theories that are still not proven to be true or not. They just, they just look like the best fit mm-hmm. to something in the past. It's like I said in our previous discussion that you know mankind has come up with this theory after a theory after another theory after another theory, modifying the original theories, and that's the best fit. Right, and that's what you've got to do when you're off on your own. When you connect with God, you don't have to do all of that. You just ask God, well, how did the universe come into existence? And 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 you can get inspiration through that process. And when you allow yourself to talk to spirits without being afraid of it, you can go, well, I don't know, but but surely there's someone who's already discovered this particular thing. I'll go, I'll, I'll ask them to come and have a chat with me about that. <laughs> You know, and you view every discussion with a spirit as just a chat, like a like a sit down, like we're doing now, but even less formal. You know, it's just something that just sit down and have a chat. And in that process, you discover a lot of information as well. But but unless you open up in love, you will not understand any of it. And that, I guess that's the potential the difference in the spirit world. The spirits have verified what you've been talking about. Yes. Since two thousand <clears throat> years ago, they can physically see it in yep. their dimension. Yes. The difficulty is what we don't, what, as you said, we're not willing to see, not willing to feel. Well, the problem is and we can't see until we get to a certain level of development. That's the problem. Until we're developed in love to a certain degree, we will not see certain things. So, for example, like even resolving the question of whether I'm Jesus or not, a person has to get to a certain condition of love to resolve that question. They won't resolve that question without it. They can intellectualise it as much as they want. They are not going to resolve the question without having a certain degree of love in their soul. And and this is the same with every other potential truth that's on the planet. You can't resolve any of it without there being a certain degree of love in the soul. And and this is what... uh, Or you have to go through thousands of years of development, longer than a human lifetime. And so most of it, most people on Earth, they live 70 or 80 years maximum generally. And so what, what we finish up happening is that if that's the average age, in a person's life in that time, they have a very, very finite amount of things they can potentially discover, and that is severely limited by their own emotions against discovering new things in different areas. So the average person has huge blockages towards discovering any new mathematical truth, for example. And for that reason, there's heaps of mathematicians involved in discovering all this mathematical truth on the planet right now, but none of us ever hear about it because none, none of us are interested. Right? And uh, the average person also has a huge amount of uh, blockage or resistance to discovering what causes disease. Mm-hmm. They want to cure the disease without knowing what causes it. Mm-hmm. Right? And because they have all that, because they don't want the cause to be themselves, that's their main blockage. They want the cause to be something external to themselves, right? They want this cause to be something outside of their, what I would call their soul. They want it to be external, some other person's fault, right? And so because of that, they are very resistant to discovering the truth about what causes their own diseases. Same problem. If they connected to God, they'd be a lot more open to their own emotional injuries and faults. They would therefore see the relationship between their own injury and the, and the, potent, and the pain they're experiencing or the disease they're experiencing. Then they would realise the linkages. Then they could spend a lot of time discovering things and cure lots of diseases in the process, right, just by going through that process. But, unfortunately, most of us don't because we have an emotional blockage towards thinking that, oh, maybe this disease got caused by me. 
You know, we can't even contemplate that, let alone... So what do we do? We go and find an external pill or we blame a doctor for not coming up with a cure or whatever else we do without understanding that it actually came from ourselves. Once I'm in this process of connecting with God, I have the ability to absorb all this knowledge. Even the cause of disease, I will know. The cause of every single individual disease, I will eventually know through this process. So through this process, if we understood, as you were saying in the first component of the interview, if we understood God's laws, we would understand that we've actually created that yes. as physical beings or, or as souls. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll actually come to understand that actually there's a, emotions in, in the soul which drive us to do certain things that are out of harmony with love. And whenever we do things out of harmony with love, there's an immediate effect on our soul in terms of the, the, it being out of harmony with love. And that causes a subsequent effect upon our spirit body and our physical body that we can actually measure through the process of creating a disease. We, when, we, when the disease is already coming and showing up in my physical form, I know there must be a huge amount of resistance in my soul towards something here for a disease to now have been created in my physical body, which is two layers deep, uh, uh, more, uh, two layers from the soul. So you've got the soul, the spirit body, and then the physical body. And if it's already showing up in the physical body, that's telling me that the problem is quite severe. Right? And so I, I can look at it and go, right, so this cancer that I have is a creation of my own emotional condition. Something's going on inside of me emotionally that's creating this particular disease. I can cure it if I discover that thing. That's the beauty. But if I am emotionally blocked to the idea that I am the creator of my own disease, I will never contemplate that truth. And therefore I will go and look for an external, something external to fix this particular problem. And what I'm saying in terms of the discovery of the universe is once you discover some of these basic truths, as you can raise a condition of love, some of the basic truths come to you, basic truths about your soul, basic truths about the interaction, basic truths about love and how love affects everything, or the lack of it affects everything in terms of pain, then, then I understand, start understanding those truths and now my mind is now completely open to going, okay, there must be something going on inside of me here that's out of harmony with the universe God created for me to get a disease that I wouldn't normally get and the average person doesn't get, so there's got to be something going on here. And as I work my way through that and grow in more love, not only will I cure that disease, but I'll also understand emotionally what created it. I'll understand the li linkage between the cause of what created it and the effect the disease itself. And if I do it this experimenting way, which mankind has been doing now for hundreds of years, cancers have been around for thousands of years, right? And mankind has still not found a cure. We've found a way to get rid of some of the effects, but we have not found the cure. And there are some people on the planet who are getting close to cure because they're looking at the emotional part of the creation. But those are generally looked down upon by the rest of society and also and by the average person because the average person wants to say, I'm not to blame for my disease. Give me a cure, doctor, thank you very much. That's what the average person still wants. When the average person doesn't do that anymore and, and, and because they've grown in love and they realise that everything is created through their own soul, they'll go, they won't be expecting any doctor to cure them. They'll be going, oh, OK, I'm going to experiment with this. I'm going to experiment with the linkage between what emotion it is inside of me and what's actually created my cancer. And I'll know when I've cured it when my cancer is cured. So that's when they start connecting to God and then realising the links, that they're actually co-creating with God's laws. Yeah, yeah. Everything so is within the framework. And like I spoke with you last time, and I don't know if I got on video last time because it might have been something we talked about uh, when it started raining, but um, remember I talked to you that God's laws are the framework for the existence of everything. So God didn't create cancer, but God created laws that cause us to experience pain and suffering under certain conditions. Right? So the reason, and through the exercise of our, our will in an unloving manner. And so, so God is not an anarchist. God didn't say to give, put us all on the inner universe and just say, go for it. You can even destroy the universe if you want. Like God doesn't do that. God loves all of, its, all of his creation, so he goes, 
I've created a whole heap of laws. It's impossible for you to destroy the universe. <laughs> You'll destroy yourself before you destroy the universe. So the universe could never <laughs> implode or on itself because of what man does? No, not, not with the way God's created it, because the only way for man to discover the law that could cause the universe to implode would be to in a, be in a condition of love where they wouldn't want to embrace the law. It's a bit like, it's a mm. bit like you know, once we, once we fully embrace love, we will discover the laws involving nuclear physics and we will understand how to use them completely in harmony with love um, right across the board. And we won't want to use them in any other way. We wouldn't want to create an atomic bomb mm. from them mm. that can destroy millions of people's lives. It's the same with the discovery of all of the, tru the truths. We can discover all of the laws involved in all of the truths, and we won't want to discover them. You know, we won't want to use any of those laws in an unloving manner, any time. So, that's what we can do if we if we're in harmony with love ourselves. So, is that the second most important <coughs> truth that you could receive from God? God's existence, God's love, as one element, and God's laws, and how to create within that. And that every law of God is based on love. And every law is based on love. So it's tied back again to, yeah. to yeah. love. So it's, like, it's like, like I said, love is the foundation of every new discovery. Every new discovery scientifically, uh, medically, like physically, educationally, mathematically, and we could go on in every field of endeavour. Every new discussion, if we have love as the framework, the underlying basis, we can discover every new thing very, very rapidly. If love is, because love, love is the framework of the universe. God, it's the key. It's the key. Mm. Key by which you discover everything. We can go through a process of experimenting, but we will still not discover everything about the particular thing we're experimenting about until we discover how love is involved in everything. So we can spend 2,000 years making this pen, right? And it's still not loving. So what's the potential of love, the boundaries of love? Can I answer why this is still not yeah. loving? Mm -hmm. Because it's got stuff in it that takes hundreds of years to decay that mm. damages the environment. Mm. So it's still not loving. Mm. So we've spent 2,000 years discovering something that has a lo loving use, but it's still not loving completely. Mm. So can mm. we go back to your question? <laughs> yeah, I was just curious about the boundaries of love. You've experienced divine love mm -hmm. over 2,000 years. Do you ever feel that there is a capacity where it's limitless or there is a limit to amount of love that you could receive. Is there any bounds to it? No. My, the more real love you receive from, from God, the more you realise that there is an infinite or seemingly infinite amount of love for God to give. And the only way that could be actually happening, if you think about it, is for God to be actually expanding as well. So, so the reality is that you know, one of the discoveries that I've personally made is that God herself isn't finite in her nature. She is actually also expanding and therefore has the capacity to give us the ability to expand and yet never reach her nature. Gosh, that's amazing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so one of the truths about God, and we can discuss truths about God at a different time, is that God is expanding. Just as God has given our soul the ability to expand, God herself is also expanding. So the more we expand, does that, does that affect God? Or is it the other way around? Or uh, is, it, is it connected in any way? It's connected, but, but it's more the other way around. Yeah. The more God expands, it affects yes, us. Exactly. Yeah. The more we expand, it affects everyone around us. Right. So, so, if you be, so in the first century, I became at one with God after 13 years, basically, of, of trying in a, in a manner that I would call as, um, what would you say, the word to be... Um, so I, I spent 13 years like, actively engaging it in, an, in, a, in a knowing manner mm. to become at one with God. When I became at one with God, that was the time that I had the most effect on everyone around me. Before then, there's even nothing recorded about me in the Bible, actually, except when I was about 12 years of age. There's nothing else re actually recorded about me. So th there's this idea that people have that, oh, maybe he just appeared or something, or there's <laughs> other ideas that people have, or well, he obviously grew up, but why is there no record of him growing up? Surely that would be an important thing to include in any book uh, regarding somebody's life. 
But the reason why is because when I became at One with God, I was significantly different than what I was before. Mm -hmm. And also, before then, I would be sitting down mending fish, fish nets with some of my friends and they'd be having all of these philosophical discussions and I'd put forward some of the ideas of what I'd already discovered. And of course, just like many now, they're going, no, that's not possible. No, that's not possible. No, he's not the Messiah anyway. So, you know, we're waiting for the Messiah still and, you know, he's not the Messiah. So, and that's exactly what happened during that period of time. Everybody was watching me and saying, yeah, but he does this and he does that and he's a bit crazy in that direction and uh, that, that doesn't all make sense. And, after I became at one with God, within a very short amount of time, anybody who met me was convinced mm -hmm. of the condition. Now that only happened when I was 31 years of age, from that time onwards. Right? So, so again, there was an outward demonstration of this relationship right, at that point. Before you reach a moment with God, there's not as much of an out outward demonstration of the relationship, so therefore people have their intellect to use mm -hmm. to work out whether the person's telling the truth or not. Mm -hmm. And so most of the people I knew, you attempted to use their intellect, and of course they used their intellect stating, well, you know, no one they know would be the Messiah, so it couldn't have been me, and, uh, and so they didn't listen very much. Mm -hmm. And why did they start listening when I was 31? See, nobody asked that question really. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they, uh, they started listening was because now they had a physical demonstration of the truth mm -hmm. that I was trying to tell them for the last 13 years. And they could feel <laughs> and it. And they could feel it, mm -hmm. and, but also observe it mm -hmm. and see the difference in the person completely. Mm -hmm. There's no injury in the person and they can see that even. Often very challenged by it, but they could see it. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, now they have the ability to to actually start questioning about things like God and God's nature and all of those kind of things. So I feel probably um, before we have a discussion next time or an interview uh, about the physical things about the universe and how the universe operates physically, we'd be better off probably proceeding down the process of let's look at God, relationship with God, mm -hmm. Because that is the framework to understanding everything else. The soul, the human soul, the human condition, why we've got pain. All of these other things, all of these other questions we could ask are all based upon having a solid answer on the first question. And the process that you went through to discover that. Because yeah. once yeah. you're at one with God, there's a physical demonstration of that relationship. Yes. But what was it that took you from... From where I From was, where you the, were the normal to the, human, yeah. if you like, to that at one condition. And what were all those feelings that occurred yeah. right throughout that process? Yeah. And what I find a little sad, sad is that because most of my first century process was done alone, um, of course there was no record ever written of what I was doing. I, I, I wasn't a fantastic scientist in the sense that I didn't keep a record of everything that I did. Uh, it would have been very hard to do so in the first century anyway, but... Um, the, because I never kept that record and nobody ever saw what I was doing, nobody ever discovered how I moved from the, the man to, to becoming at one with God, mm -hmm. to becoming what I would call the divine human soul. Mm -hmm. like, you know, not, not God herself, or not, so I didn't mm -hmm. ever view myself as God and I still don't, but rather becoming a part of God. By, by this relationship, by receiving divine love to the point where you're now at one with God's thinking and one with God's feelings on all matters. And um, that process is what I'm trying to just point out to people now. And, of course, there's a lot of detractors because most people, you know, even if they look at the first century record, there's no record of me mm. ever doing those things. But there is a huge gap in time between mm. 12 and 31 years of age of which nothing is recorded. Just in terms of God's existence and God's love, within that framework where you, at the time where you came at one with God, when was it completely 100% confirmed for yourself that God existed and that you need to receive God's love to evolve? Um, when I was very young in my, and this is now asking questions about my life in the first century, I suppose, <laughs> and it would pay for us to do a set of interviews about mm. my life in the first century in total, because that way we would give concise answers about all sorts of things. But if we just give a brief summary, basically, by the time I had my first conscious thought, 
I was already feeling like God existed um, because I felt I could feel God. Um, but I didn't have the feeling, I didn't know how to actively uh, engage the process of becoming at one with God. I didn't even have the concept at that time that I could be at one with God. Right? That grew over a period of time through discovery, through a lot of discovery, through trusting what I was attracting through, through my soul condition, attracting through the law, what's called the law of attraction to me. All of these things were telling me truths about God and telling me truths about what I had to do to become at one with God. So in my reading of the prophets and my reading of a lot of first century, you know, of the scripture that was available to me in the first century when I was growing up in Egypt, um, I, I discovered a lot of basic principles about morality and, and about things like that that I had to incorporate into my life in order to become at one with God. I discovered a lot of things about love when I was reading the books of the prophets, particularly the book of, I think it's Hosea. Um, and, you know, once I read that book, um, I started understanding a bit more how God views uh, us humans, her children. And in the process of doing that, I started to experiment with all of the things I was discovering and then found the connection with God growing. And then I understood the scientific process of connecting with God. And then I understood that that scientific process of connecting with God was very, very similar to the scientific process that people around about me were using to do all sorts of things. But they weren't connecting with God. They weren't using the scientific process to discover God. And so that's what that's when I started to... And by the, at that stage, I was around 18 years of age. Once I realised that there was a process that I could go through from a, in a scientific manner by measuring what was happening to my body and measuring what was happening in my life, looking by that stage I understood the, what was called the law of attraction and what like, it was bringing into my life to teach me things about my relationship with God and about love. Once I engaged that process actively, which I did when I was around 18 years of age, then I could start progressing quite rapidly and, and change quite rapidly. Not a religious concept, but scientific process yeah see. it was a scientific mm. process connecting with my creator i i've never viewed my connection with my creator in a religious manner um, i've always viewed it as just a personal relationship with my creator i feel that what's happened is that many other people around about me sort of viewed it as a more of a religious thing because i was talking about god all the time mm. Um, and therefore they viewed it as a religious thing and so then they felt that they had to create a heap of rules about it and so forth, many of which were wrong and distorted what I was mm. doing but um, it's still the same today it's still exactly the same today we can connect with God through a process that is scientific you can measure the results of it if you sincerely do it but it has to engage your heart it has to engage mm. your true emotions not the ones you hope you have so it has to engage your true personality, your true desires, not the ones you have for everybody else to see. You know? yeah. And uh, once you understand some of these things, you can engage the process actively and actually go down the track of doing it in a really scientific, quite, quite scientific manner. And in the process, you'll discover God, but also in the process, you'll discover yourself. Secondly, you'll discover your mate, your partner, which God, the other half of you, which God created for you. And then you'll also discover all the other truths about how the body works and how the spiritual body works. And, you know, you, you understand all of these things that mankind has taken thousands of years to discover and still hasn't really discovered. You discover very, very rapidly and then can also utilise in a practical way. Based on your own desires. Based, based on, on your, your own, own desires, soul yeah. qualities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So once I discovered that in the first century, my primary desire was to show others that primary point. So I wasn't very focused on demonstrating the scientific aspects of other things. Uh, I was only interested in demonstrating the scientific aspects of what a connection with God does for the human soul. And did it grow for you? Could you feel it growing over the years? Of coming, course, yeah. 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 And I could feel my own soul expanding, expanding in its capacity to understand everything. I could mm -hmm. feel everything that was happening around me. It got to the point once I was at one with God that I could feel everybody exactly what they were feeling exactly what they were thinking. Did it happen just like that or was it a process that... It's a process. What was that, that moment? Was there an absolute moment when you knew you were at one with God? Yeah. 
Yeah, there is an absolute moment when yeah. you know you're at one with God. And you, from that moment, have a permanent connection with God, which you can feel. Mm. There's no unhappiness from that moment. There's no, mm. there's no frustration from that moment. Everything is perfectly perfect in operation. And on top of that, uh, there is no fear in you from that moment. Mm. Any more, no fear exists uh, from that moment on. Mm. But on top of that, you get some additional abilities. The ability to read a person's mind, mm. for example, is present immediately. Whereas at the moment, some people have what they think is the ability to read a person's mind, but what mm. they actually have is a, is a spirit who can read the person's mind, telling yeah. that person what mm. the mind of that person is saying, mm. you know. Um, and also you start reading person's bodies as well, like their emotions in their body and right. what emotions are causing their diseases. Mm. You have the, obviously the ability to cure their mm. diseases, but only in harmony with yes, in love, love. Mm. Right? only in harmony with God's laws. Mm. You wouldn't choose to do it outside mm. of that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. We'll probably um, wrap it up. What there, is but... the time now? Uh, ten past two. Quarter past two. Oh no, we can keep going. Uh, one or two. What? Uh, I think Mary's starting at three, isn't she today? Yeah. We can keep mm. going if you like. Um, have we discussed most of the questions that people have, or uh, a lot of the other questions physical in nature? There are a lot of them are physical in nature. Yeah. Um, we could probably go back to. Hmm. You were talking about the 3D complexities of how the universe works, yeah. and you were about to give an illustration, and then I asked the question in terms of how to, where does Earth sit, and I just wanted to know whether you wanted to explain that a bit further, that illustration, and again, it's more physical in nature. Yeah, um, the way the Earth fits in the universe is uh, very different to how religionists in the in the dark ages come up with which was the belief that the earth was the center of the universe and the sun rotated around the earth and um, it's also very different to this whole idea that we currently have which is that the universe has run a great big explosion into existence and therefore everything going outwards in direction the reality is the the galaxy that we are sitting in is traveling in a similar direction to other galaxies around us and also uh, there is this flow, this flow um, that occurs all the way through the universe in a certain direction. And it's in a rotational direction that's much larger than our own physical universe is. So the physical universe that we live in um, is, a, is limited in its nature in comparison to what the real universe is. So the, re the real universe is a mixture of what we ha see as the physical and then what we would also conceive as the spiritual but there are also additional uh, dimensions that actually don't have physical matter or spiritual matter in them they have uh, what i would classify as soul based matter in them as well and uh, and once you get to a soul union condition you can start to experience those universes now um, the earth itself if you think about it from that perspective is a really a tiny speck like uh, less than a pinprick Within the whole framework. Within the whole framework of, uh, you know, billions and billions of galaxies in literally what I've, as far as I understand at the moment, in terms of what I feel, thousands of universes, right? So, so of which they all have their own galaxies and their own and so forth. And, and the, uh, my understanding at the moment too is that, and re bear in mind that I haven't remembered everything because I'm not yet at one with God, so I haven't remembered everything. And it's important with all of these interviews to understand that in the future I may have to change some of the information I tell you because I haven't remembered everything because I've not yet dealt with all of my unhealed emotions in, in this life. So, so once I deal with them, I'll be able to remember everything about these particular things and even give you, hopefully, scientific formula and everything to, to back up the... Including how old it is, sizes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, as far as it... You know, there are certain things that uh, mankind, no matter no matter how long we're given in terms of time, without talking to God, we can't really discover because we weren't present at the inception of it, so we can't really know. But there are, there are a lot of evidence... There is a lot of evidence to support certain things. So with regard to our Earth, which was where, where it is in our universe, so our Earth is obviously a tiny little pinprick, if, and, and far smaller than that, actually, in a, in a solar system, which is a tiny little pinprick, 
in a uh, in, rotating around a black hole that rotates around another the super black supermassive black hole in our galaxy. So you've got the supermassive black hole. Uh, our 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 system, if you like, our stellar system, is rotating around a supermassive black hole, and and our solar system is ro rotating around another black hole. Um, so you've got this process of it's rotating around the black hole, rotating around, and and we our Earth. Uh, rotating around the sun, the centre of our solar system, in that space, if you like. So, so of course, our location in the universe changes, uh, literally uh, over a period of time, literally by hundreds of thousands of light years, it changes our position in the galaxy, in terms of we're, ro we're in a rotational space around the galaxy. So, therefore, we're we're changing in our positional space. Um, and the galaxy itself is moving as well in a direction uh, that is controlled by forces that are actually not a part of the physical world, but actually, or phys they affect the physical universe, but they are forces that are far beyond and far more powerful than the physical universe based on the spiritual universes that exist, the dimensions that exist. And then those forces are controlled by an even far more powerful force, which are, is what I would call the soul forces that exist. Um, which which are beyond the uh, far beyond the physical power of the physical forces that exist in our universe. Do you have much remem remembrance about the soul dimensions realms? Well, at the moment, that's the hardest thing for me to remember. Um, I remember the feelings in the condition, um, but I've still got to go through a lot more emotions to actually completely open up to that place. Even when I become at one with God, there is still uh, basically there's 29 more dimensions for me to cover before I become in my soul sp union space again. So, so the easiest things for me to remember are the basic laws associated with a physical universe, the basic laws associated with our soul, and how our soul works, the basic forces, the basic details about God, God's love, God's truth. And all the basic, some of the basics about most of God's laws. The hardest things for me to remember at the moment is the soul union condition, which is still far removed from what I've got to work through emotionally. To to do that, myself and Mary must work through the same emotions as well. So that that'll be some of the last things we remember. But just to give some background. I've now remembered that there's not 22 dimensions, but rather 36 dimensions. Um, so in other words, the soul, the soul union condition is in the 36th dimension, and that every seven dimensions there is a major change in the soul of a human. So, so in the first seven dimensions, and when the transition between the seventh and eighth dimension, the major change that, that I remember is the change of Receive, becoming at one with God and, and the beauties of different abilities that that gives to the human soul the next major change is the transition between the 15th and 16th dimension um, that change from what I remember at this point in time is a change where you can create things and give them life from your own soul so you don't have to, you're now not dependent upon giving new things life from God's soul so before then, when you create a new thing in the spirit world from the 8th to the 15th dimension, you can create new things quite easily. But when you create a new thing, you have to ask God to, to give it God's living force in order for it to become alive. Only in the spirit world? Uh, you can do it here on earth, but nobody's ever been. I wasn't in that condition in the first century because I was only in a 10th dimensional condition in the first century. So this is a transition between the 15th and the 16th dimension. So I couldn't do it in the first century. Uh, and, but I do expect to be able to do it in this period of time where we live this time, where you create a, living, a creature uh, through genetic structure that you create and mould, and, and instead of having to give it life, ask for God to give it life, you can actually give it life. And that's a major transition that occurs between the 15th and 16th dimension of the spirit world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then in, in the next major transition that occurs to the human soul is between the 21st and the 22nd, and the next one is between the 28th and 29th, and the next one is between the 35th and 36th. The 35th to 36th transition is the transition of a soul union, where the soul, the human soul, that has up to then been split apart, has grown together, 
so to now have exactly the same desires, exactly the same passions, exactly the same longings, exactly the same knowledge and, and everything in everything, and they can make the transition from the 35th to the 36th dimension where they become one again, uh, unified soul. Mm. That's, from that moment on, you now understand the soul worlds of the spirit oh, yeah. world. Does that make sense? So yeah. all of the spirit dimensions, which are these mm. 35 dimensions before then, you grow to understand through this process, but on the 36 you understand all the 35 and now there is also this new dimension. And right at the moment, we are actually going through the creation of the 37th. Through your existence on Earth? Uh, through this process, yeah, of what, what we're doing on Earth in process in love and refining in love, the creation of the 37th is beginning to form as we're doing this creation. So that, that's what I remember at present. Um, in terms of the major transitions between the 21st and 22nd dimension, I can't remember what that major transition is at the moment. Um, and the major transition between the 28th and 29th dimension, I can't remember that major transition at the moment. But you were involved in every one of those creations? What do you mean by that? You know? created those dimensional spaces yeah, as you yes. progressed in love? Yes. I, I was the person who created all the dimensions right to the 35th dimension, and the 36th dimension was created through the amalgamation of the soul of myself and Mary. On the physical sphere, would there be a measurable event that would occur? to match those those transitions? Um, not really. Uh, there are measurable events occurring on Earth based on our soul, our soul changing, but the dimensional existences exist in other dimensions. So mm. there is an effect, of course. Once a new dimension is created, it does have a flow-on effect to all other dimensions. So now there is a much greater power of love that's now flowing from that dimension to the other dimensions. So it certainly does have an effect. It's uh, in terms of measurable. Well, measurable is based on sensitivity, uh, whether we're sensitive to measuring such things. On Earth, hardly anybody here on Earth is sensitive to measuring many things. However, that is changing. What is happening at the moment is is as the soul of myself and Mary changes on on the planet you will find significant changes on the planet in terms of how people interact with each other. There's going to be more anger and fear, but there's also going to be more love. So it, there will be a confrontation, if you like, between truth and error in the process. And that's happening, and we're aware of that. I'm aware of that happening. You know, I, can, I can feel the awareness around me of all of those things happening. Um, it's not something I discuss much with people because they're already challenged by what I say to them, let alone, <laughs> um, let alone uh, speaking uh, about all the things that I have yet to speak about that I know are going to severely ch challenge most people. Um, the key, though, with all understanding is what, what we said earlier, just this God's love entering the human soul. That, that under when, be Before that happens people will not even understand what I'm saying mm. most of the time. So it's more, it's like a creation <laughs> potential of growth in love. Yes, it's like, a, well, you, you have the ability to talk to other spirits, right? And you've spoken to some Palladian spirits um, in, your, you know, in the in past. In the past, yeah. And um, you remember in their discussions with you, they talked about their fascination with myself and Mary because of the fractal uh, geometry mm. of our soul. And it was very, very different to anything else that I'd actually seen. And that's why they were quite fascinated with us and around us quite frequently. You remember that? Yeah, discussion? when you appeared on Earth, when you were born. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, re the reason why many spirits are doing the same thing is because uh, for the first time they have the ability to see a uh, soul that's gone through the soul union process and the effect that it's had on the physical and spirit bodies of the people when they, when they reincarnate on Earth. But that's, that potential hasn't been available to them to examine. Mm. And so now they have the ability to examine that now. And, uh, and therefore, many spirits, even, even spirits who are intellectual in nature, are quite fascinated with the examination of it. Mm. Mm. It sort of gives them a bit of courage, more faith that you can actually evolve and do something different. Yes, yeah. Because uh, uh, for many of those spirits, they believe that there's almost two separate creations. They mm. sort of believe there's the creation God made that can expand infinitely, and then there's the creation God made of the human soul that's limited. And that's not true, but it's what they believe to be true because they've used their intellect 
to try and understand things that they can't understand and then they believe that well those other people who can understand things that we don't understand they must be a different type of creation mm. and it's not true god created one type of soul human soul and placed them in many physical dimensions um, and those particular beings they actually felt that they were separate to the human race that they they named themselves palladians and yeah. as did other spiritual people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like syrians and so forth yeah because they've in the spirit world, they felt that they were creating laterally. Uh, they were creating and they could see impacts in the spirit world yes. of what they were doing. Yeah. But that's not necessarily the truth. No, the well, it, you know, it's a, it's a very small part of the truth. They're in the sixth dimension of the spirit world, creating laterally, um, thinking that they're changing when they're not actually changing, and uh, believing that they're understanding more truth, but they don't really get it yet because the soul's not open. And when the soul opens, as the experience of those spirits after they had a chat with me, had once the soul opens now they have the ability to absorb a whole new piece of information and all of a sudden the discovery of fractal geometry and the human soul is not important yeah. and uh, the and significance of that went out yeah yeah they'll actually start talking about feelings exactly they weren't actually describing what they were seeing any longer they started to talk in a knowledge of how they were feeling exactly so so yeah. they made a transition from intellectually analyzing the human soul and what it looked like and the spirit and the effect on the spirit forms and what that looked like to go, wow, 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 I'm more interested in understanding the emotions that caused that particular interaction. Mm -hmm. And so they were more interested in the causes rather than the effects. And that's an automatic process. And, and it's the same with the discovery of the universe. There are so many things that we see, that we measure, that are just the effects of what's happening. And in fact, uh, there's still some major misunderstandings on the planet. You know, we're, we're, we are looking at things on the planet even that are happening and we, we're looking for a cause that's outside of ourselves. We're, we're looking for a cause that's not the collective condition of the human soul. Like what's happening with the Earth, for example? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and instead, we need to say, OK, actually, it's my soul that has the greatest effect on everything around me. Not, not my physical mm -hmm. actions. My soul has the greatest effect. My emotions, therefore, have the greatest effect on every single thing around me. If I understood that one basic truth, I, I, instead of going out and building a building, that's out, you know, I'd, I'd be looking at feeling about, like, why is it that I can't imagine the building and it comes into existence? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a concept that you wouldn't even think of. Now, I'm not saying don't go ahead and build a building. What I'm saying is you'd experiment with that process of imagining it and pulling the matter into existence. And people in the spirit world have experimented with that and have come to see that they can create using that technique, um, which obviously is a lot faster <laughs> method of creation than getting out of picking a shovel and starting with the foundation <laughs> of a building. Um, so, you know, this is a major problem, I feel, and this is why our discussion about what is the primary thing that we can mm. learn about the universe the irony is the primary thing we can learn about the universe is not really about the universe, it's about God <laughs> and, and, and how love permeates the universe. And once we understand that and we connect to that love, we now have the ability to understand all these other things. But that's almost like a byproduct. It's not like our major fascination. Our major fascination is the relationship with God. Mm, I'm starting to gather that it has the greatest importance. Yeah, yeah. So it's like I'm fascinated about all things, as you know. You've spent a bit of time with me, Andy. You know that I'm pretty much fascinated about anything you can introduce. <laughs> anything you haven't seen before, you'll yeah, do. <laughs> yeah. um, but my primary fascination is God and my relationship with God and the human soul and the human soul's relationship with God. My primary fascination, one of my primary fascinations also involves discovering God's laws, which I remember I said to you last time, it's like the framework through which everything comes into existence. So, so I can create a new dimension as long as I understand the framework by which it comes into existence. And, uh, but I can't do that if I don't understand the framework. So the dimensions wouldn't be really that important to us because at the end of the day, we are still discovering who we are and we're growing in love. That's, yeah, that's yeah. our creation, yeah. our discovery. And they're the important to us it. to the degree they add to our happiness, they improve our understanding of God. They, so they're all fairly important, but, but they're, not, they're not like the be-all and end-all of every, all of our considerations. So at the moment, for the majority of people on Earth, you could say that their job is probably their primary important thing. Mm. You know, like, you know, for most people on Earth, there's a desire for them to at least have enough money coming in. Yeah. And then and retirement. So, and, yeah, and so money becomes a fairly important thing mm. in there. 
like uh, you know obviously when you hit the spirit world money is doesn't exist <laughs> so that All very soon does not become a very important thing yeah. anymore you know can, you know some people still come to earth and they're worried about what happens to their money but after a while that disappears as well as a desire and so that's not important mm -hmm. so if you throw out money as being important right now and you throw out you know your physical existence as being important because you believe that you're an infinite being with the possibility of infinite expansion what would you do with your life if you start to explore. Well, you'd firstly want to know what do you really want to do to with do. your life, wouldn't you? you know, the first thing you do is probably be self-reflective and think about your desires, and then you'd engage that without any fear. Mm. You, you mm. wouldn't have any fear associated with the engagement of your desires. Mm. And in the process, you'd create very rapidly. Now, there's been people on Earth who have done that to a degree, and they've created very rapidly, some negatively mm. and some positively. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and that's the beauty of what God's created too, the potential of our soul to create in any direction is also, but, but God's also given us the framework by giving us feedback. And so when we feel the pain and suffering, we know that we created in a direction that wasn't very positive. When we feel the joy and happiness and peace and, uh, and other emotions that are associated with uh, joy, then we know we've created something in a positive direction. Well, there's an example of God's love right here, your teaching. Mm -hmm. There's a great gift that God's making that available for the rest of the world based on your desire. Yeah, and, and every one of us has desire to share uh, what we discover. You know, there's, there's billions of spirits who have discovered a lot of truths. Every one of them has a desire to share. It's just whether the person who they talk to is, has an openness to hear. Mm. And... Uh, and I feel on the earth we're still quite blocked to hearing. We, we want to believe we know everything and we know very little while we're on earth. And we have the ability to know a lot, but, but it's very limited at this point because of our arrogance. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel a lot of that in me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So perhaps our um, next interview should perhaps be about God, eh? Hmm. about God, God's nature, characteristics, mm -hmm. attributes, questions about, you know, what God's created, God's laws, because I just feel like that's the framework mm -hmm. by which we understand everything else. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know there's been a lot of questions that people have asked on that subject, isn't there? There has been a lot of questions on that, and there's a lot of questions, like, in terms of the future direction of the universe, yeah. about other existences of dimensions within dimensions. Yeah. Have you met any of those? Are there people, aliens... Yeah, you know, all, the, all those sort of questions. Yeah, and there are answers to all of those questions. Yeah, um, yeah I, I feel it's important probably at this point to note, though, that the universe is continually expanding hmm. and new dimensions are being added to the universe at all time, uh, you know, as, as we proceed in our soul's expansion in love. That being the case, we can discuss something about the universe today and in 10 years' time we could add another thing that we just find out about the universe. Um, so, so we need to understand with all truth this underlying quality, and that is truth cannot be limited in the, its nature. It's mm. going to have to have an expansion, uh, expansion quality to it, a changing quality mm. to it, where we're going to have to come to understand, oh, that's the truth we knew at 2012. What's the truth we know at 2020? What's the truth we know at 2050? It's going to be different because of the expansive process that truth has. What, if you think of God as being the, you know, the knower of all truth and growing infinitely, then, then it makes sense that there is an infinite amount of truth to discover. And um, the question then becomes, how rapidly can I discover it? Hmm. And what I'm saying is if we go down this path that mankind has gone down tra tra traditionally, this path of self-discovery uh, through experimentation, you're not going to discover it in millions and billions and perhaps billions and billions and billions of years. If you go down the track of connecting with God, you know, connecting to your own soul and experimenting with this personal relationship with God, well, you'll discover quite a lot in 2,000 years. Right? And that's the difference. You'll also get to enjoy all of the things you discover <laughs> in that time. So you, in the first interview, you mentioned that nothing can exist permanently in, in the universe that God's created, that's unloving. Yeah. So 
there could never be an ultimate situation where people would exercise their free will to not be loving. No, because the way God's created her universe, there is an actual law that, that every time I act in an unloving manner, then there is pain that actually is reflected in my own soul as a result of my actions. So eventually the pain gets so much it creates disease. And eventually the disease gets so painful that it creates so much incredible amount of suffering that we realise the linkage between what we're creating and the pain and suffering that we're experiencing and we stop. So the hells will never exist any longer? Well, the hells exist now, obviously, mm. but, but, but there is, a, because people are creating pain, creating pain, still creating pain in themselves, but they get to a point where they stop creating pain because the pain is so intense, they just want to stop. And once they get to that point, they stop creating any further degradation in their soul. And from that moment on, they have the ability to grow. From that moment on, they have the ability to change in a positive direction. And what God's laws do is create a framework where it's impossible for a person to permanently stay in that, in that, in that place. So you can think of the most wicked people who have ever been on earth. It's impossible for them to permanently stay in their wickedness the way God's created the universe. Given enough time, they will come to their senses. What about the other extreme? Can they remain permanently just in, developed in natural love without receiving God's love? Well, um, that is a point that a lot of spirits are still discussing as to whether that's possible. But the reality is that change is the continual operation of the universe. In fact, the way it works is that even love is always going to change. It's always going to grow. It's like love between two people can only become stagnant when the two people are not growing. So, so it's the same principle in the universe. Love, love is always changing and growing. That being the case, if you think about it from a theoretical perspective, if a person is in a stagnant condition of love in the sixth dimension of the spirit world and they are not changing, they're just moving around laterally, thinking they're changing, but in reality they're just learning more things intellectually but not changing in love. If they're not changing in love, then potentially they are degrading. Everything in the universe that doesn't change in, in some in positive direction degrades in its condition. Yeah. And, uh, and then so the question that many of them are asking and have been asking for a long time now is what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? Now, conceivably, something could happen to them. Uh, because uh, they are not at one with God, so therefore they don't have love, divine love in their soul. Divine love in their soul is what prevents them from remaining stagnant. Um, so they don't have that. So what are they going to do? Like, there is potentially, you know, in maybe hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, we don't really know, but potentially they could change their form into something else where they're not conscious of themselves anymore, potentially. But these are all just theories, because we don't know. But there is the feeling that uh, many people in that location have, in the spirit world in that location have, that there is the potential that, you know, they could disappear or, or something else could happen. But again, it'd be a loving potential. God would create a loving place or situation for them. Yes, what I believe is going to happen is different to that, what is different to their theories. My, my feeling of what is going to happen is that God will remove the potential of divine love being given to humanity for a period of time. During that period of time, these people in that condition would realise that something has changed and go through a period of transformation where they long for God's love. Once they long for God's love, God's love will come back again and they can enter them and now they have the ability to grow infinitely. So my feelings are that given enough time in the universe that it's impossible for everyone not to discover God, mm. given enough time. It just gets back down to how much time do we have to be given <laughs> yeah. for that to occur? Yeah. And how much time do we have to be unhappy? Mm. How much time do we want to be unhappy mm. is the other question. Mm. You, uh, you stated in the first interview that God's teaching us to be parents of other souls. That, that, that is one of her underlying purposes. Well, that's, Could you uh, explain what that means? I, I feel that's, that's my, one of my current theories um, in the sense that that's one of the things I haven't proven yet and so therefore it's just a theory, something I'm experimenting with. But 
my feelings are that God, through this process, is teaching, having our soul to grow, and the natural transition of the soul would be eventually that our soul is able to create other souls. At the moment, I haven't, you know, I, I'm, at the moment, I've been through the process in the spirit world where I can create other beings, like, other, like what you would call animals, um, and ask for life to be given to them or, or give life to them once I made that transition. But I've never been able to create another human soul. Like that's always been God's domain. And, uh, and my feelings are is that that's eventually one of the things that God's leading us to do, to eventually be able to create other human souls. So it's almost like learning about all of God's attributes and qualities by doing the same thing God does. By good doing it. Yeah. Through demonstration. Through demonstration. Yeah. I think the way God teaches us is incredibly powerful. What God does is God as the more you become at one with God and when you become at one with God, the more you progress in that condition. The more you you finish up absorbing God's nature and so therefore you finish up absorbing a lot of the things that God can do. So you finish up doing things that God can do and that you couldn't do before. And, uh, and I feel that's one of the things that God's teaching us. But it's really only a theory at this point. Mm. Mm-hmm. But it still gives you a lot of uh, encouragement, I yeah, guess. Exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. Mm. Yeah. 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 And as I said, too, there's things I haven't remembered. So, um, you know, I've got emotional penitence at the moment to remembering certain things about the universe and, and, you know, God's plans for the universe and so forth. And once I work my way through those emotional impediments, then I feel a lot about explain quite a lot of detail about those particular things with accuracy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Joe, thank you for your thank time. Thank you for yours too, Anthony, you. and and for you too, Lisa. Yeah. 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 And we look forward to questions that people want to send in to us. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, what's our next course of topic? Our next topic will probably be God and God's nature. Will it be? I Something feel so. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, can you just show who's involved, like who else is here? Like just if you pan around and just show. So there's, yeah, <laughs> there's Jane. So there's Jane. And Jane's been Taking notes. getting a lot of the frequently asked questions and putting the frequently asked questions down in some kind of order. And creating more questions. And creating more questions as she goes. Yeah. And then there's Vlad. Vlad's helping us with all the technicals, like filming and, and setting up and dismantling and so forth. So it's Vladimir. That's Anto's brother, actually. Then we've got Igor, who some of you would know now. So this Igor has um, been looking after a lot of the production of all of this and they're getting it on YouTube and all of those kind of things. And if, if you can use that camera to look at... Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> at Lena. Lena's been behind the camera, um, usually behind the camera facing it myself. And, and coordinating uh, all this. And coordinating a lot of the uh, um, getting Best together with questions and also who's going to be doing the interviews and so forth. And then there's different members of people who wanted to become a part of the interview panel, of which Anto is one. But we're happy to all, all sorts of people to interview, but they have to have a bit of a passion about the mm-hmm. subject. And, and Liz is also a part of that process of wanting to do interviews and, uh, and be a part of the recording p- process. So that's been who's been involved today. Just wanted to introduce the audience to... And don't forget you. yourself and Mary for uh, the yes, desire to share the myself, truth. But you know me and, and Mary. <laughs> and Mary's Mary not been involved today, but, yeah. um, but uh, she will be involved in many of the future discussions. Some of them will be like this. We will be doing some of our future recordings by actually going out, there's been questions asked about myself and Mary about how we live and things like that. And so to do that, we're going to take you out on our property and, uh, and show you how we live and where we live and, and, uh, and show you how a lot of the things that other people say about us are very untrue but, uh, in that process. But we'll answer a lot of questions on lots of different matters through that process as well. But I'd like to thank you guys all being involved with this everyone's volunteering their time so I'd like to thank each of you for doing that thanks guys thank you thank you